cafeteria to the terrace, and there will be the welcome reception. And after the welcome reception, there's actually the poster session again downstairs here. So, 7 o'clock, uh, welcome reception. And the second thing is, uh, in the last lecture, we passed through this uh, list with your names and uh, asked you to sign and put your team number there. Now, if you have already signed and put your team number there, no problem, everything is done. But uh, we are still missing some names, so I will pass it through again. If, if you have already signed, just pass it on. And we want everyone to sign and want to put their team number there. If you don't remember your team number or you are not yet assigned to a team for the mini projects, then please approach me because we want everyone to be part of a team. Okay, so I will pass this through the rows and then uh, enjoy the next lecture by Harold Thank you. Good. So I, 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 uh, as I promised to give the second lecture on microwave optomechanics, and of course I knew I will have an overlap with John, which I thought it would be like one quarter. Now it looks like more like three quarters. On the other hand, it's it's not such a bad thing, as I said also, because I will be explaining maybe mostly the same things. But I will be explaining them differently, so if you didn't understand him, you may still have a chance of understanding me. But if you understood him, then probably you will not understand me. So just you can try and see. Um, now, uh, so I will be talking about uh, first microwave cavities, what it means and how, how they are quantized. I will talk about optomechanical coupling very briefly because uh, yeah, okay, because because we will we will hear that again from, from Clemens, and I don't want to duplicate very much. I will talk about optomechanically induced transparency, but show you some things John didn't show you. And and then I will in the end very briefly talk about quantum states. I will be also talking about quantum states on my last lecture, so we will see we'll see how it works. Uh, all right, so now we already all know that optical cavities is the best way to to think of optical cavities is, is like a good example is a Fabrice Rho cavity when we have just two mirrors and the light is trapped between two mirrors uh, and because it's trapped uh, there are just resonances which, which correspond to certain frequencies. Right? And then we said good if maybe one of the mirrors is moving then it's an optomechanical cavity. But that's with optical light or maybe far infrared. Now, if you want to do the same with microwaves, how do we make cavities? Do we have microwave mirrors or what the hell do we have? And, and the answer is, okay, we don't, we don't have mirrors, strictly speaking, or at least if we do, they don't look like that. But we have the simplest example of a cavity, just an LC circuit. So that's an electric circuit. I mean, microwave cavities are not cavities, they are not optical, they're just electric, they're electric circuits. And this electric circuit just has two elements, I mean it's a capacitor and an inductor. Uh, I already apologized for my drawings, but now things become aggravated. It was better when before, before I exported it as a PDF, so for whatever reason some lines shifted. And it's likely to propagate to other slides. But anyway, so that's supposed to be a capacitor, and that's supposed to be an inductor. And let's spend some time on this slide and go to some details to, to make sure that we all understand what's going on. Right, so if we have capacitor, well, it means we have sometimes we have, well, somewhere we have voltage so between, between, between those two plates, and we have the charge on the two plates, and they are related, and that's something which I already discussed in my first lecture today. So the charge is proportional to the voltage, and the coefficient is the capacitance. Now, if we have inductance, yeah, we can also rewrite it like that, so we can take a time derivative of those. Time derivative of charge is current going through the capacitor. And uh, so then, then we get an equivalent relation that the current equals to capacitance times the time derivative of the voltage. All right, now we also have flux, whatever it means. And flux is related, it's proportional to the current, and the proportionality coefficient is inductance. 
Now that probably less familiar, but it becomes more familiar if you again take a time derivative, because uh, the the uh, time derivative of flux is minus voltage, and then voltage equals to it should be minus uh, inductance times uh, time derivative of the current. And now instead of these strange things like instead of charges and fluxes, we just have two equations which relate current and, and voltage, and we can easily transform them into one equation. For instance, if I take that one and take another derivative, right? So on the left hand, uh, no, let, let me take that one. On the right hand side, I will get L times I double prime, which is here. And on the left hand side, I will get V dot. And V dot, we know, is I over C, right? So if I write I over C equals to L I double dot, and I put C on the other side, I get that equation. And we can also write the same equation for voltage, if you want. And now if I get that equation, that of course something which, uh, and again that should be minus sign which propagated from here. Uh, so that, that we know how to solve that equation, right? So that, that's something which we learn in the first year at the university. And we also know that this is the same equation as describes a harmonic oscillator. Right? We can say now current is coordinate, and if there is no friction, the friction is not in this equation. The, uh, the, the uh, second derivative of the coordinate equals to the first, uh, equals to the coordinate times frequency squared. Right? So our conclusion is first of all that this thing acts as a harmonic oscillator. And then this harmonic oscillator is just a single mode oscillator with the frequency we can, which we can read out from this equation. And if we do it, then we get that the frequency is just 1 over square root L times C. Uh, right. Now, uh, there, there are two things which I, I need to add. One is, as I mentioned, we don't have dissipation in that equation. Now, Clemens already spent some time explaining this, that actually adding dissipation is not a trivial thing. We can just add it phenomenologically, saying, okay, there is also a resistor around. And if we have a resistor, then, you know, current is proportional to voltage. And in the end, that would make this equation more similar with, to, to, to the equation of a harmonic oscillator with the dumping term proportional to the resistance. But if you want to quantize it, and I will quantize this equation uh, on a couple of, sli couple of slides later, then we have all kinds of headaches. You cannot easily quantize uh, oscillator, an oscillator where you have friction, and, and, and you have to go to complicated model of quantum dissipation, which is called a legato, whatever Feynman, Vernon, or whatever you want. And, and that's not easy, and that's not something I'm going to do. So we will, for the time being, we will disregard the, the resistance. At some point it will reappear and I will show that. Now, second thing is in, okay, so that, that's far, so far it's, it's, it's just, it's just uh, a theoretical analysis. <laughs> I mean, and there is no reason why I should call this a microwave cavity, right? This frequency can be anything depending on which capacitances and inductances you can fabricate. And there are basically a broad range of what you can what you can make out of it, and it's not necessarily a microwave. Now, uh, 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 actually, in in practice, in in the optical mechanical experiments, people use frequent uh, people use cavities with the uh, frequencies in the microwave range, which is one to ten gigahertz or even more narrow, actually. I think John had 7.5, and that's around what, what you have, like 5 to 7, I think, 5, 5 to 8. Uh, now, here there is one more thing, which is uh, all experimentalists know it. Theorists usually, usually don't care, but that's a good place to care about it. This frequency is omega. When you talk to experimentalists and ask what their frequency is, it's not omega, it's f, which is omega divided by 2 pi. So we have to be careful every time we take actual numbers, because f 
is 1 to 10, but omega means 2 pi to 10 times 2 pi, right? So 6 to whatever, 60. Uh, and why, why they use that, uh, I'm not in a good position to explain, but I was told that there are some practical reasons, there are some filters which only work on that frequency. I don't know. Something which, which for me is completely not understandable. But that's just life. They just use it. Uh, now that's also actually practical because uh, if you want to do any useful experiments, we don't want temperature to be very important. If we don't want temperature to be very important, means we actually have to compare. Oh yeah, I have it on the slide. We actually have to compare the energy of the uh, of the of the microwaves, one quantum of of the radiation, which is h bar omega or h times f, if you want. Uh, we have to compare that with the thermal energy, which is kBT. And for instance, if we take uh, if we take uh, f, which is five gigahertz, then we get temperature which is thirty millikelvin. And you can uh, again in practical terms, you can in a dilution fridge you can go down to ten millikelvin. So you still have uh, you still have that which is bigger than kBT uh, without making too much effort, and and, and that's useful for for the experiments. Uh, we have seen again uh, that for mechanics that, that doesn't work and you need to cool it, but, but that's a separate story. At least you don't need to cool that. Uh, right. Now that was just an isolated cavity. Now what people do with optical cavities, they measure transmission and reflection. Now with microwave cavities, you also want to measure transmission and reflection. And okay, you just need to, to do the same as, as you do in optics, you need to add a waveguide. And the waveguide is also some electric circuit, could be a transmission line or could be whatever. You just send send some some whatever voltage along the line. The voltage comes here, something happens and it gets out or it gets back, and depending whether it gets out or, or back, it's uh, depending on which side it gets out, it's transmission or reflection. Uh, now uh, I, I, I promised to mention at least that there are losses which could be due to resistance. And there are losses which happen outside the cavity and inside the cavity. So inside the cavity is just resistance of the, of the cavity. Outside is the resistance of the transmission line. Uh, and that's something you, you, you also can take both uh, some both. Okay, I, I, I must explain what is that actually. Kappa is the, the line width. So kappa has the dimension of, of energy or frequency, and that's the line width of the cavity. Uh, and you can assume that those losses are independent, so the total line width would be the sum of internal and external losses, and uh, actually it will be important in some, in some situations, and I will show you in which situations it will be important, where losses actually happen. Right. Okay. Now, now we have to quantize it and make sure that it's similar to to a cavity. And again, we already know that it's a harmonic oscillator, and we know how to quantize a harmonic oscillator. Clement spent quite some time today in the morning to show that. So, with what what we are going to do is just to do exactly the same as what he has done. All right. So first, we write the energy classically. And there is an energy associated with the capacitor, Cv squared over 2V is voltage. And there is an energy associated with the inductance, Li squared over 2I is current. And now we know that this V and I are like coordinate and momentum of a harmonic oscillator. And what, which one is coordinate and which one is momentum, it doesn't really matter. It's up to us to choose. Uh, so I've chosen voltage to be coordinate and current to be the momentum, but, but it, it doesn't matter, as I said. And so what we need to do now is to write this current, uh, this voltage and current in terms of this creation and annihilation operators. Or you can say differently, you can introduce creation and annihilation operators in this, in this way. 
And so what you do, you know that somewhere should be some combination. Should, there should be A plus A dagger, and somewhere else should be A minus A dagger. And you want both operators to be Hermitian. And if they are Hermitian, then this coefficient must be real, and this coefficient must be purely imaginary. Otherwise, you have trouble. Uh, and then what is exactly here? Well, you need to, to derive. And you derive it from, from general consideration. Uh, so first of all, you know the commutation relations. That should be the commutation like that. And second thing you know is that you should reproduce the classical equations of motion. So if you take this now voltage as an operator and calculate V dot, that should, that, that, that should obey the Heisenberg equation. And this is something which you can calculate if you know the commutation relations. And OK, that, that's, 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 that's a bit tedious thing, but, but Clemens has already done it. So I will not do it. And I will show you the results. So the result is, is basically here. So the coefficients should be like that. If you want to reproduce the classical equations of motion. Oh, sorry, I should probably written what it should, what it is. So in the end, you should get on one hand is that. But on the other hand, you know that you should get, uh, what is it? Uh, is it L I dot? You should get. Uh, you should get this, so you should get I divided by C, and I is also an operator which you know. Uh, right, so first of all, you get two coefficients here, which are indeed real, which, which contain H bar, which is fine, which, which contain, one of them contains capacitance, another one contain, contains inductance. Uh, you can check uh, I will not go into do it, but you can check that both equations of motion for voltage and current are the same as we expect. And then you can also derive the Hamiltonian, which is not surprisingly just that. And that's something which we perfectly expect for, for, for harmonic oscillator, and that's also Clemens derived in the morning for the, for the cavity. So, so far, we just have exactly the same quantization, so we, in quantized form, our microwave cavity behaves exactly the same way as an optical cavity, which is not really surprising because both of them are kind of cavities for electromagnetic radiation. Right? Okay, now that was so far, I didn't have any mechanics, it's just, just an electric circuit. Now let's include mechanics. How we include mechanics? That's something which I discussed in the morning. We have we could have capacitive coupling and we could have inductive coupling. We could have capacitance, which is position dependent, and we had some examples of that. And we could have inductance, which is position dependent. And I didn't have examples, so I referred you to the lecture on Thursday. So let me stick to the capacitive coupling. The results don't depend on what, what you choose. You can choose even both, it doesn't matter. So let me assume that capacitance is position dependent. Because, for instance, something is suspended over the gate, I mean, some part of the circuit or whatever. Uh, some, uh, and I assume that inductance is not position dependent, doesn't matter. So if capacitance is position dependent, there's also something which we have done in the morning. That, okay, well, in the simplest situation, uh, this, uh, this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, deviation, uh, this, this, uh, uh, displacement, this mechanical displacement x is small, so we can just de, uh, take a derivative of, of of capacitance and write something like this. Uh, and if you write it like that, that gives rise to the energy of the cavity without any mechanical motion. And that is proportional to x. That gives such a term, which is the interaction term because it depends on the both the displacement and uh, the uh, degree of freedom of the cavity, which is in this case voltage. Right? Now, okay, that's classical. 
Now we need to quantize that. We know how to quantize voltage. Voltage is proportional to A plus A dagger with some coefficient. So from voltage squared we get that. We know how to quantize the coordinate that, that Clemens has done in the morning. I don't have it on the slide, but I will write that x is just the amplitude of zero point motion times b plus b dagger. And so A are creation annihilation operators for photons in the cavity, and B are creation annihilation operators for, for, for mechanical motion, for phonons, if you want. And this is just the amplitude of zero point motion, which is, what is it, H uh, 2M omega or something like that. Um, now, OK, I get, I get that term which is a bit complicated, but we should understand that actually those operators A and B are still time dependent. And if they're time dependent, here we have four combinations, well, five combinations. So we have A, A, no, actually more. We have like A, A, B, and A, A, dagger, B, dagger, and all these kind of combinations. And most of them, are very quickly oscillating. And uh, if you look, those which are not oscillating quickly, that's the only, the only thing up to the commutation relations which survives. And uh, all others, if I, if I, if I uh, take the, if I, if I go into, rotate, uh, in, into rotating wave approximation, which is exactly averaging out terms which rotate fast, that's exactly what this rotating wave approximation is about. Uh, then all others I, I would disregard uh, if, they, uh, if they are fast. Now again, there is a caveat coming with that. That's in principle a perfectly correct thing to do, but only if your coupling is not very strong. And I will, I will talk about that, and, and John talked about that, today, uh, and I don't want to go into any details at this point, but, but the, the important thing is that coupling is, is very strong, and I don't want to quantify it now, then uh, it's not sufficient to, to only keep those terms, you should, you should also keep some other terms, well, all other terms, essentially, because they would be quickly oscillating, and quickly oscillating, meaning they are not resonant, so they will uh, okay, uh, but 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 since they are multiplied with a with a big number, they could still be important. But for the time being, I will just disregard them. I get this coupling. I call it radiation pressure. Is it really radiation pressure? I mean, is it is it something which 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 we usually get in optomechanical cavities? So let me spent several minutes and review optomechanical cap coupling in, in, in optomechanical cavities. So that's something which John has done and something which Clemens will do. But still I need it now, so I will I will still 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 spend this couple of minutes. Right now we already know what is radiation pressure on the classical level I showed you in the morning. Now we need it on the quantum level, and, and radiation pressure is this term, which is coming from the position dependence of the cavity frequency. So remember, it's x times n, number of, photo, of, of photons. Number of photons is here, so it's a dagger a, and, 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 and this is, this is uh, b dagger b, b plus b dagger is coming from the quantization of the, of the coordinate. So in the first instance, that's the same thing. I mean, here it's with minus, here I wrote it with plus, doesn't matter. It's a, it's a matter of convention. Now we can start thinking about, okay, yeah. Now, now it's a good, good, good point for me. So, so it's, it's the same thing. So we get the same radiation pressure. Now uh, I, 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 uh, I, I need to talk about the scales because that's important. And again, I will have an overlap with, with what was 
before me and what is coming after me, but still I will, I will spend some time explaining exactly those points. So you have several energy or frequency, let's say frequency scales. Uh, and, okay, so you have the cavity frequency, which is the biggest. You have the mechanical uh, line width, mechanical dissipation, which is the smallest, unless you do something. Un unless you on purpose make it, make it, make it big, which you usually don't want to. Then you have uh, cavity line widths and you have mechanical frequency. They are both in between, and they could be of the same order, and then uh, actually mechanical line widths could be bigger. But usually we want to be in that regime, which is called resolved sideband regime. And John already explained it in quite some, quite some detail what it means. Uh, basically, if we generate side bands of mechanical motion, and the, the distance between those side bands is mechanical frequency, but the width of each of them is kappa, so if uh, uh, we are in this situation, then they are resolved. You can just see them separately. If you are in the opposite situation, you cannot resolve them, you just see them as one peak and, and, and cannot do it. Okay, now on top of that, we need to add this coupling, which also has dimensions of, of frequency. And this coupling, I, I didn't actually uh, emphasize that, but this is something which is made of uh, this, this zero frequency, uh, amplitude of zero, of zero point motion, and of this derivative of the capacitor, so that's something which, which doesn't which we don't have very good feeling about. I mean, it's some combination of some of some things which which are specific to the uh, to the device we are talking about. Okay. Now, uh, in the literature, if this coupling is below kappa, it's called weak coupling regime. If it's above kappa, it's called strong coupling. Now, depending on where this kappa is, you can still differentiate. You can call something ultra strong coupling. Uh, that's that's not relevant for what I'm going to talk about. So for me, it's only relevant weak and strong. Uh, now, uh, what is important that actually strong coupling, in this sense, has never been achieved. Well, I mean, there are some caveats to that, which, which I, I don't want to discuss. There are some people who can reasonably claim that they achieved that, but then it's not exactly the same. So I, I will not go into that. I think as a, as a kind of general statement, it's okay. Um, and it's very difficult to achieve. It's called single photon strong coupling. Now, what you can do, you can say, okay, maybe we don't need that. Maybe what, what we need is we can, we can put a lot of electrons, or sorry, a lot of photons into cavity. And if you put a lot of photons into cavity, then the system is almost classical, right? Because if you are in the regime of the number of photons much bigger than one, it's almost classical, and we can linearize it. And say, okay, this A is approximately square root of number of photons. I will explain in a second why it's approximately and not exactly. Uh, now then, okay, so let, let's, let's, let me call it the average. The average, let me just call it like that. It's still approximate, but, but I will come to that. Now I can say, good, fine. Why don't we just try that A is some average plus delta A, and we just take this expression, uh, and, 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 and write it as A plus delta A and A, sorry, A dagger uh, plus delta A dagger and A uh, plus delta A. And then this equals to A dagger A. And then we have A dagger delta A. And then we have A, uh, sorry, A dagger delta A. And then we have L delta A dagger. And then we have delta A, de delta A, dagger, delta A. And I can say, okay, this is small, right? The cavity is almost classical, so that's almost that. So this should be small. Let's throw it away. 
This is there, the, the biggest term, but that's not interesting because it doesn't know anything about the fluctuations. So we are only left with those terms which are responsible for the, for the interaction. And those terms exactly is what I, what I have written here. Uh, well, not exactly, but, but I, will, I will come to the next slide and explain why it's not exactly. So, uh, and, and then you have this new coupling, which is, which is well, this G0 times the square root of the number of photons in the cavity. And the number of photons in the cavity is actually very big. So what you do, you enhance a lot the coupling. And so this new coupling you call multi-photon strong coupling, because there are many photons. And this one actually can achieve strong coupling, and it has achieved strong coupling, and, and John was talking about that for half an hour. Right, now he also had this slide, well, equivalent of this slide, but let me still, still go through that, because I want to understand that we are all on the same kind of page. Now, look, if I, if I, if I, uh, if I look here and now think about what terms are resonant, if I want to make, to, to, to make rotating wave approximation, which terms should I keep? I kind of naively, I come immediately to a conclusion that I should not keep anything, right? Because, uh, again, they're time dependent, but a dagger uh, oscillates with the frequency of the cavity and B oscillates with the frequency of mechanical resonator. And here you take a difference, but this difference is cavity minus mechanical. It's still a very big frequency. So it looks like they actually oscillate very quickly and they're not resonant at all. And then why didn't we just keep out other terms which are also not resonant? And if this is correct, it kind of uh, invites a lot of questions. Now, in fact, what happens is that actually our, uh, what, what, what I call average A is also time dependent. So its amplitude is square root of the number of photons, but it has a phase which is oscillating. And if you oscillate it, it oscillates with a driving frequency plus or minus, I never remember, um, plus. And this is a correct statement. And what I have over there is kind of short way of writing this correct statement. Of course, the number of photons doesn't oscillate, right? So, but, but it has, this A has a phase which results, results in, like, like in this G, we have this time constant. Right, so then we have, if we drive the cavity, here we have the driving frequency, and here we have the cavity frequency, and here we have the mechanical frequency. And now we need to take and to, to add them up and see which one is resonant. And that's what John has done. That depends on how you drive it. It's not coming by itself. Uh, if you drive it, for instance, at the red, uh, at the red side bend, so if you drive it at the cavity frequency minus mechanical, then only those two terms are left. So you have uh, this uh, A dagger gets, gets with the minus cavity and B comes with plus mechanical, and they all three cancel. And, and that's a complex conjugate, uh, a Hermitian conjugated term. Now, and, 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 and then you are left with interaction which only has those two terms. And that's beam splitter interaction. You can also drive at blue side bend. And if you drive at blue side bend, then those two terms will will be uh, uh, will 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 be resonant and then generate squeezing. And then those terms are resonant and those terms are not resonant. And again if you drive at some other frequencies you want to keep all the terms which you have and because they can be all important. In particular, if you drive at resonance, then all terms could be important. Uh, right. Mm. Okay, I, I'm, I'm now going to the experiments, and my 
as I said, my general idea for, for, for this lecture is to convince you, or, or kind of reinforce if you're already convinced, that uh, microwave cavity can do the same things as optical cavities. They are, on some level, they are just very similar, only parameters are different. And to kind of help you, I put here two pictures, uh, four pictures of cavities, and two of them are optical, and two of them are microwave, and I'm pretty sure that if you don't, if you are not in the field, if you are not doing experiments with optical or microwave optomechanics, and if you don't know the groups which I cite, you will probably not be able to tell which ones are microwave and which ones are visible light. Uh, now, in fact, those two are visible light and those two are microwave. So those, uh, this is a photonic crystal uh, structure from, from Oscar Painter's group in Caltech. And those are, uh, how they are called, toroidal resonators uh, of Tobias Kippenberg, ATPFL. Uh, they are both optical cavities, and here the, the, the photons are trapped like that, and here they are trapped in this constriction, as I already explained in the morning on a, on a different example. And we have actually seen both of those cavities in other lectures, and I will uh, cite them later today, when I, because they, both experiments were actually done to demonstrate uh, the quantum nature of mechanical resonance. And, and, and those two I, I borrowed from, from uh, my colleagues in Delft, from Gary Steele's group. I, I'm actually on both of the papers, so borrowed is not probably correct. Um, this is a, uh, a cavity with a graphene membrane, and they have like, this is the, this is the, the feed line, so that, that's, that's the waveguide, and, and that's, that's a gate. And where is the cavity? I don't, well, it says here, but I don't actually know what, what is exactly the cavity. Uh, and that's from the same group, but completely different cavity. So that's originally Yale design uh, from Rob Sholkov group. So these 3D cavities, which is really like 3D box out of aluminum. And then you have a membrane in the middle of this cavity, which, which is an oscillating, oscillating element. Uh, and actually this, uh, in, in this publication, they, they set the world record for the temperature, which is 48 milligrams. For, for, the, for the mechanics. Right, uh, now let, let me, um, okay, I should go through this slide. So that, that kind of sums up what uh, I was talking about for, for 50 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, what, 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 what can be, I, I mean, what, 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 what are microwave cavities? What, what can we do with them? Why are they useful? First of all, I hope I convinced you that we can at least do the same things as we can do with visible light. So whatever experiments we can, we can do with optical cavities, we can also do with microwave cavities, having in mind that frequencies are different and quality factors are different. But, but So the different regime, but, but the same physics. Uh, now there are two other things. Uh, one thing I will not explore in my lectures. I will mention it briefly today in the end of the lecture, uh, that uh, the, the cavity frequency in, for microwaves could be comparable to mechanical frequency. Um, well, for optical cavities, that's not possible. Because if you are in invisible or far infrared regime, you are using hundreds of terahertz radiation. There are no mechanical resonators with 100 of terahertz frequency, as far as I know. So the, the highest frequency I've ever heard about, which was useful in context of optomechanics, was 20 gigahertz. And people usually don't even use that. Uh, there are some experiments, and I will show you one of them, where you can use uh, low gigahertz resonators. Uh, uh, usually people don't do that. They, they go to megahertz or kilohertz. So usually in, 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 in all microwave, definitely in all optical experiments, uh, uh, the 
frequency of the cavity is much bigger than the frequency of the mechanical resonator. But in principle, if you have a microwave cavity, you can make them resonant. You can if you take a particularly stiff mechanical resonator with, with the frequency of several gigahertz, you actually can make it in resonance with the cavity, which would change all the things I was talking about. Right? Because all this analysis, uh, whatever red side band, blue side band, it assumes that the mechanical frequency is much less than the frequency of the cavity. If it's not the case, then this analysis is actually not good. You have to, to look at things completely differently. That's not done very much, not, not, not theoretically and not experimentally, but, but that's a good direction to, to think about and whether you can get any advantage from, from this. Uh, now, another thing which I will not be talking today, but I will be talking on, 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 on Thursday, is that you can make uh, microwave cavities nonlinear. I didn't yet mention that all, whatever, not all, but, but most microwave cavities which are used as superconducting, you don't have to know what the superconductivity is. I will. Uh, if nobody does it before me, I'll explain it on my lecture on Thursday. Uh, but uh, superconducting junctions, which, which are used in those cavity, they have some additional properties. And one of these properties is, is Josephson effect, which again, I don't want to explain right now what it is. But that's some nonlinear effect in, in current. And because it's nonlinear, then your cavity becomes nonlinear. Right, and an optical cavity is very difficult to make nonlinear. You need to put some whatever nonlinear medi media inside, a and that's not not trivial. But you can relatively easily can make using this Josephson effect. You can make uh, a microwave cavity nonlinear, and that's something I'm going to talk about on on, on, on Thursday. And so for the time being, I'll stick to that, and I will start. Uh, with, uh, with that. That's something which I already actually mentioned in the morning in slightly different terms, but it's useful to see it again. Now, for instance, what we can do, we can say, okay, we don't care about the cavity. We only want to know what are the properties of mechanical resonator. Uh, then theoretically you would need to, well, experimentally you would need to measure a resonator or measure it by means different, differently from the cavity, which is not easy but, but possible. Theoretically you would need to eliminate the cavity. So you would need to solve, uh, let's say, equations of motion for the cavity. They would depend on the position of the resonator. You would need to, to find the number of photons and plug it in in the Hamiltonian uh, for the for the number of photons in the cavity, which then become the full Hamiltonian for the mechanical resonator. Now, if you do that, then you find that there are some things which happen, uh, and they, they 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 even happen if you don't drive anything. So they they have so you 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 you, you if you don't drive the resonator, you just can, can. Well, everything is is coming from the cavity. Uh, so one thing is frequency is renormalized. I showed you it on example uh, without a cavity, but it doesn't matter. Uh, that's uh, in this business it's called optical spring, as I said. Uh, now damping coefficient is renormalized. I also spent some time explaining that. And there is a very easy f physical intuition. Why? Because you now have an additional channel of dissipation of energy. Which, 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 which affect damping. Now, uh, this, this uh, force can become nonlinear, so the resonator can become nonlinear if you do it properly. That people didn't explore, but, 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 but it could happen. And another thing which I didn't discuss, but it's also trivial, that the equilibrium position of the resonator could be shifted. And that happens because, remember, uh, we had this equation of motion of the resonator let's say m x double dot plus m omega naught over q 
uh, x dot plus m omega naught squared x equals to to f of x and if you expand f of x you renormalize the frequency for instance but you could also have a constant term you could also have a term which is just let's say plus f naught and if you have this f naught the only effect of f naught is to put it here and renorm and, and renormalize the the position of the the equilibrium position of the effect. And now, well, you can also look at the cavity, and so the same thing happened with the cavity. The frequency is shifted, and uh, the, the damping is renormalized, and I will actually need this formula for the later, so I will just bring it without any attempt to derive it. It's not trivial to derive. So the uh, total damping of the cavity uh, uh, is uh, renormalized, so it goes either up or down depending on whether you drive it at the red side band or blue side band and the, uh, the, 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 the shift of the damping is just four times this uh, coupling squared divided by, by gamma and now if you look at it carefully you see that we are comparing kappa with 4g squared over gamma meaning we are comparing 4g squared over gamma kappa with 1 which we John called cooperativity, and that means that some horrible things happen when cooperativity becomes one. Right? At least if you drive it at the blue side band, then at some point this thing gets renormalized and gets negative, and if you have dumping which gets negative, it means you have instability. That if you have this uh, oscillator, with negative dumping, negative dumping meaning negative quality factor, and you drive it, uh, the role of this term is usually to damp the oscillations out, but if instead it's positive, it amplifies the oscillations, and instead of damping, they just, the amplitude goes up with time. And that's an instability, and, and that's something which you, uh, you, you, you need to do something about that. I will probably will have an example on, on my last in my last lecture um, now again I, I already showed you this uh, this this cavity uh, uh, just just to emphasize that I will be showing the experiments coming coming out of that um, and I will spend some time again on optomechanical induced transparency but I will not attempt to to, to give the same explanation as John gave, so to explain what is exactly what is exactly uh, interfering with what, I, he was he was clear enough, and I, I will instead I will I will show you the results. Right, so the experiment is well we have a cavity resonance, so this is uh, uh, this shows basically the line width, so that, that the cavity as a function of of frequency. Uh, now we have a drive. And we drive it uh, at the red side band, so at the frequency which is cavity minus mechanical. And we can strongly drive it. And we also have a probe laser which collects, which measures the, the, the transmission close to the cavity resonance. So we drive it with one laser here and we probe the transmission here. Uh, okay. Now, you have seen the result, and I will also show you the result. But before I show you the result, let me, on two slides, torture you with some uh, formulas, which, which I will not explain comprehensively. I think Clemens is planning to do it at some point. But at least I will give you an impression how these results are derived. I will not go through the whole derivation, but I will show you the result in the end. Now, what technique which you use to derive this result are so-called input-output relations. And those input-output relations are just fancy words for the equations of motion for the cavity and for the mechanical resonator. And here there are, that's a lot of symbols which, which com look completely kind of unfamiliar. But if you look carefully, that's not such, such a difficult thing. I mean, if you look at first equation, let's first ignore those two terms. 
we only have that, that, and that. And that you can actually recognize. You can actually recognize as an equation of motion for the operator A. Right? Because you have dA over dt. Similarly to that, you have I over H bar, H, A. And then in H, you have cavity. You have mechanical resonator. And cavity is A dagger A. And mechanical resonator is B dagger, or let's say X squared for, the, for my purpose. And um, interaction. which is a dagger a x and then if you start thinking about that okay so you have this term would give you the first term and this delta is the detuning so that's a difference uh, I thought I have it somewhere no I don't have it so that that's a difference um, on on uh, on the driving minus uh, minus cavity, which is typically minus uh, mechanical frequency. Uh, now you have mechanical resonance, so X squared commutes with A, no problem. Doesn't produce anything. And in the interaction, if you calculate this commutator, you get A times X. And, and that's what you get from, 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 uh, from the Hamiltonian. Well, there are some kind of couple of technical steps hidden like you need to go to the rotating frame, and I will, I will not do that, but that's my, my kind of purpose is to convince you that it's not black magic, or not exactly black magic. Uh, now, there is, well, there is a little bit of black magic, actually, because there is one thing which is here, is the cavity line width. And as I mentioned before, that's not something we can derive, or at least cannot easily derive. We can only put it by hands, and I basically put it by hands. Uh, another thing are those terms, and they correspond to the input, so what you send to the cavity. Uh, and you also have quantum noise. I will not be explained in any reasonable way in two minutes why they are written like that, why here you have this external, well, okay, you can think maybe uh, input should only depend on the external losses, but why should be the square root? I don't, I cannot explain easily, and I'm not going to do that. But at least we should understand that it's not kind of strange that we have input and we have quantum noise. Right, and then that's all in the literature. So every time you need to do this calculation, I'm pretty sure all of you can do this calculation if you really you know, pressed to the wall and, and set to, to do it by your supervisor. Uh, there is literature, can go to the literature, and you have enough knowledge to, to understand what they've done uh, and, and to reproduce. Now, those two are equations of motion for the mechanical resonator. Uh, so we have x dot, which is p over m, which is not very much surprising, I guess. And we have p dot. And in P dot, you have actual force acting on the oscillator. So you have a return force of the oscillator. You have force coming from, from the, uh, from the uh, radiation pressure, which would be proportional to, to A dagger A. You add by hands mechanical damping. And if you want, you can also can add thermal fluctuations. And here we assume that, that thermal fluctuations are irrelevant for, for, for the cavity. But if not, we can also add them in the same way. OK, so you, you get a set of nice nonlinear equations, which are all time dependent, and, and you are completely lost. And then, then, then what you do is you try to figure out what the solutions could be. For instance, if you draw it with some frequency, uh, uh, then, then in this rotating 
uh, in this rotating frame, the frequency of the drive is that, so the drive minus probe. And, uh, and then your solution will also have that frequency, and you linearize, and we say plus and then minus, and you calculate, and then you have linear equations, which are all at the same frequency, and you can solve them, and in the end there are some recipes how you calculate the transmission through the cavity, which I will not go through, that, that's all uh, written, for instance, in that paper, uh, in, in, in the supplementary. Uh, so my message is not that, that you can instantly learn how to do it, but, but that it's nothing really complicated, it's all doable, all described in the literature, and can be easily adapted to your situation if you need to modify it in some way. Okay, here are the results. Uh, I will have experimental pictures on the next slide, and John shown, have John has shown you similar pictures, but let me sketch what you get. So, as I said, for transmission as a function of frequency. Now, without any optomechanical induced transparency, we would just have a cavity resonance. Now, with optim and, 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 and this is something, so the line width here is the line width of the cavity. Right now, if we include this optomechanical induced transparency, we have additional peak, which is exactly at the resonance, and which is very narrow, so the, uh, okay, very narrow and very high. And now, here I quantified, uh, there is a full expression which I could put on the, on the slide, but it's not particularly interesting, so I will rather, rather show the, 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 the line width and the, and the height. So the line width is just that. I think I probably forgot, I forgot four here, I'm sorry for that. And if you write it in terms of this cooperativity, which John already introduced, then it's just mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, line width, one plus C. So if you have weak coupling, it's mechanical line width. If you have strong coupling, that's mechanical line width times cooperativity. Uh, so that is why it's much more narrow, because mechanical uh, line width is much less than the cavity line width. Right now you have also the, the, the height of the peak, and that's the transmission. And now I promised you that uh, these this, uh, losses will play a role, this E to C, I have it on a different slide. That's a ratio between external losses and total losses. So external and uh, external plus cavity. Uh, now, in principle, you can, yeah, usually if this E to C is bigger than one half, the cavity is called overcoupled. If it's below one half, it's undercoupled. And if it's exactly one half, it's optimally coupled. And, and, and there is, sometimes there is a good reason to, to have an experiment at exactly one half. Uh, so, for instance, yeah, if, if, if the cavity is optimally coupled, so if this thing is one, so two E to C is one, then we just have one minus one divided by one plus C, which is C divided by one plus C, and the whole thing is squared. And so if you are if you are at strong coupling, you are actually a, that's almost one. If C is much bigger than one, then it's one. So you can go up to transmission one. If you are not at strong coupling, then, then it's below, but okay, it's still it's still something which can be considerably bigger than, than the cavity itself. Uh, and another thing which I, I will mention is that actually you can use this optomechanical induced transparency to calibrate C. So it's probably one of the easiest of the easiest uh, ways to see how strong is the coupling, how strong is your optomechanical coupling. Right now, um, this is not the original experiment. The original experiment is that paper. Uh, but that's uh, the experiments from, again, from Delft, uh, from this cavity I showed you. 
that one. Uh, and, uh, okay, so they see this, and I should explain why they see that. Because they have a cavity, which is a single port. So from a single port cavity, you cannot measure transmission because it cannot transmit anywhere. It can only reflect. And indeed, what they measure is reflection. So for reflection, you don't expect a peak like that. For reflection, you actually expect a dip at the cavity resonance. And that's, that's what they see. We should look at the lower curve. And then the dip becomes even deeper if, uh, if uh, uh, because of the optomechanically induced reflection in this kind. And it can ideally go down to zero. So he doesn't, but, but that depends on how you couple what, what are the losses in your cavity, what is this parameter E to C, and, and whatever. Now, that's another one which I didn't mention before, but you can also drive it at the blue sideband. And you also get optomechanical induced transparency, but you see in this case, it has an opposite sign. Uh, so instead of suppressing the reflection, it enhances, uh, yes, it enhances the reflection. Uh, so you don't have a reflection, you have something else. And since they don't have transmission, if it's not reflection, it's absorption. Rather, the only way you can get rid of the, of the radiation. And so they call that uh, optomechanically induced uh, absorption. And, and this is optomechanically induced reflection. Uh, right. Now, before I, I, I go to my last topic, I'm actually, I have a lot of time, which I'm probably not going to use. Uh, let me show you something else concerning this optomechanically induced transparency, and that something else is, is related to parametric driving. Now, parametric driving is, is a fundamental concept, which I think all the speakers today already mentioned, and I expect, actually, Mark Dickman to, to, to spend some time on that. So I will not spend too much time on this, but I still introduce you what is that and, and what are the results which we can get. So parametric drive, a parametrically driven oscillator is that oscillator. So you see that the equation, which is different from, from the one which I had here and erased, by two, by two kind of uh, features. One feature, there is no external force, which is F cosine of omega t. Instead of that, you have something here. You have renormalization of the frequency, so you have correction. And this correction has a double frequency. You can say, okay, that's still an external force. So it's still externally driven. But this external force is proportional to x. It's not what we usually call, it's not, it's not a driven oscillator. It's something else. So that's on the level of equation. Now that's actually something which we know very well. Because like the, the simplest example of this, of this parametric oscillator is a swing. If you have ever been on a swing, you know that you, well, there is no force except for what you do with the swing. And you have actually uh, to force it twice during the period, which means you are operating it with a double frequency. And that's why, why, why it swings. I right know that there is some, okay, that, that's something which you can solve and that has been solved, whatever, 200 years ago. And, and, and here I summarize the results. Now, if, okay, so what I plot here is, uh, is not an amplitude. Uh, that's uh, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a, a plane in the parameter scale. So we have two non-trivial parameters. One parameter is the amplitude of the parametric drive, which is omega p squared. And another parameter is, uh, uh, is uh, the detuning, so how close you are driving it to the resonance. And then, if you don't have dissipation, so if Q is infinite, then there are these two straight lines, and above the straight line, the system is unstable, meaning you can drive it to infinite amplitude. 
unless something happens, typically something happens, I mean, it's non-linear and the amplitude is stabilized or there is something else. But if we are talking about that equation, that equation is, in this equation, the amplitude is driven to, to infinity. And here it's not driven. And uh, uh, if you include dissipation, then this 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 uh, this 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 line actually becomes becomes curved like that, and it goes a little bit up. So uh, you still uh, here it's still still straight line, but you have some some parameter space where you can still parametrically drive it and not go to infinite amplitude. Okay, that's something very general. Actually, it has nothing in principle, nothing specific with with optomechanics. Uh, l let me show you that, that I believe that the only non-published data I'm showing uh, in all my three lectures, uh, that's again, uh, that, 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 that's happening in, in, in Gary Steele's group, and Daniel Botner will be here next week, and I expect him to either present it as a poster or, 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 or basically be around it, if you want to talk about, about, about the details of the experiment, so it's, uh, he is the, the, the right person to talk to. Uh, now the idea is, okay, so let's imagine the same optomechanical induced transparency experiment with some additional feature, and this additional feature would be, let's also drive on top of this laser, of this drive laser and the probe laser, let's also mechanically drive the resonator at a double frequency. So that's possible, I mean, you can put it on a piezo substrate, for instance, whatever. There are many ways you can drive a resonator. That's a much lower, of course, much lower frequency uh, than, than, uh, than the cavity. Now we know from, from here that if we drive it parametrically, if it would be just a resonator, it would eventually become unstable. Now it's not just a resonator, it's a resonator coupled to a cavity. We have this non-linear coupling, we have everything. What would it do? And, and, and can we actually see what it does? Now the answer is, which I'm not going to, to derive, I, 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 uh, again, I would be happy to talk if somebody is interested, but I, I didn't put it on my, on my slides. Uh, the answer is, uh, the, 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 uh, this, this parametric uh, driving of the resonator would result in enhanced optomechanical induced transparency. So in this experiment, you can get a peak of the transmission above one. So you will get transmission more than one, which is not very much surprising, right? Because it just means that we somewhere generate more photons in the system uh, by uh, by when, 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 when the light transmits through the system, so there is nothing. I mean, it's, it's unusual, but there are no physical laws which prohibit that. Transmission of light can be above one, and the mechanism why we generate those photons is exactly because we have this, this oscillator which is swung, swung to the amplitude uh, which, which, which is very large. Okay. Now, um, I have like four slides left, and I will probably finish ahead of time, which is probably not bad, given that, that the last lecture of the day. Let me talk very briefly about quantum effects. Now, what, what would be cool if, uh, okay, our cavities, both microwave and optical, are operating in the quantum region. So we have full quantum control of, of those cavities. It would, be, it would be great if you would also have a full quantum control of mechanical motion. Well, because then we could, for instance, we can use this mechanical resonator as a transducer, because we have seen mechanical resonators are coupled to everything, and this everything can be made quantum. Some more easily and others are less easily. But, but they can be made quantum, and we could generate quantum states, I don't know, of, 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 of light or of spin, and maybe we can use mechanical resonator to transfer quantum states of light to spin, 
which are, by the way, on the same frequency. Uh, maybe we can store their quantum states, because we know there is, uh, we have seen that the line width of the cavity is much bigger than the line width of the mechanical resonator, which means that the cavity states coherent much shorter than the mechanical resonator could stay coherent. And this difference is, is several orders of magnitude and can be improved. Uh, so maybe we could just generate quantum states of the cavity and then upload them to mechanical resonator and then read them out uh, on a scales for which cavity would not be able to keep them. And if you're kind of really thinking about, you know, technologies, maybe we can use it to build a you know, quantum internet or something like that. Now, I, I, I will actually not be talking about quantum states. I will talk about them a little bit on my lecture on Thursday. Uh, but kind of the first point is not really to talk about quantum states, but about can we at all make mechanical resonate quantum. And uh, here there are two obvious problems. And one obvious problem is that if we want the mechanical resonator to operate in the quantum regime, we need to make sure that the frequency of the mode is much bigger than KBT. And we have seen that for mechanical resonators, unless you go to really very high frequencies, to, to gigahertz, if you take usual mechanical resonators, that's not really possible. So there are two ways out. Okay, yeah, I should give numbers. I, I, we have already seen them, but let me repeat. So for instance, if you take one Kelvin, the frequency omega, not F, corresponding to this one Kelvin would be, would be 100 gigahertz. And we just don't have mechanical resonators at this frequency. So you either need to, to go to really high frequency, you can maybe take 20 or, or 10, and hope that it's still okay if you go to, to, to low millikelvin. And, and that's one direction. And another direction is to cool this mechanical mode. I will not be talking about cooling. There will be enough people on this school talking about cooling. Uh, I, I don't think I can add anything, but, but that's, we should always keep that this is an option. So there are only two options. Either you work at high frequencies, mechanical frequencies, or you cool down the system. If you don't do any of that, then, then you're not going to. Now, once you solve that, there is another problem that you actually need to make sure it's quantum. Right? And that's not as trivial as you think. Because you need to identify some features which are quantum. You need some, what, what people call, uh, whatever. So you, you need something which you would look at and you will be sure that this is a feature of the quantum, quantum motion of the mechanical resonator. And that's actually not trivial because if you have a harmonic oscillator, classical harmonic oscillator and quantum harmonic oscillator are almost similar. I mean, of course, you can quantize it, but once you start calculating things like average displacement or uh, average fluctuations of the displacement, you will see that they are the same in quantum and classical case. So you need here to, first of all, you need a quantum detector. So you need a system which would be able to measure quantum properties. And for instance, we were, we were talking about, uh, in, in my first lecture, I spent some time on, on, on capacitive coupling and, and on charge detectors. I didn't call them charge detectors, but but, but you have, you can read out the position with charge, and, and we were talking about that, but they're classical. So if the, even if the oscillator is quantum and you are using exactly those methods, you will not notice that the oscillator is quantum. So you need something else, and, and you need to decide what you want to measure, which are the signatures of mechanical motion. Now today I will stick to the experiments. Uh, and, and there are not so many things which you can measure. Uh, and, and the first experiment, uh, that's by, by Andrew Killand and John Martinez groups, uh, so that's 2010, what they have done, they actually didn't use cavities. 
they used, they here they solved it in, in terms of, 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 of taking a high frequency, high frequency resonator. So they had a res specially fabricated resonator with 6 gigahertz frequency. And they, uh, they still needed to solve the second problem, and they coupled it directly to a qubit. Now again, I mentioned qubits today, and I'm not going to explain what their qubit was, but, but a qubit is a two-level system over which you have full degree of control. So you can, uh, just a second, you can basically, if, if this qubit coupled to another quantum system, you can transfer this quantum state to the qubit, and you can measure this quantum state, you can get all the information about it. Yes, please. Can we uh, briefly why people still the quantum qubit just because it's Is the question is why all the qubits have this frequency? I, I believe I that's, that's, exa that's exactly the same reason why the, the superconducting microwave cavities have frequencies around 6, 7 gigahertz. And I believe that's a technical reason. But I, there must be experts in the audience who know better than I know. What, what I was told is something general and has to do with the external circuit. Can anybody, John, can you confirm that? I mean, I would say below like 3 gigahertz. Good. And so what they what they did, they indeed couple it to to couple it to to a qubit and they measured the state of the qubit and got information about the state of the mechanical resonator. And they actually claimed that they could uh, they could manipulate, like they could address the two lower state of the mechanical resonator zero and one and coherently manipulate them. Um, now this experiment actually nobody ever have repeated that experiment or have done in this direction. Uh, and I think that's because they, they encountered a number of problems. And in particular, one problem was that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the lifetime of these quantized states of mechanical oscillator was very low. And that's unexpected because, as I argued, uh, actually the mechanical line width is very high and you expect this time to be mechanical line width. But for whatever reason, it was it was it was much, much uh, the time was much lower than than, than 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 the line width, and because of that, they actually don't have very good pictures. So I uh, filled my slide with pictures, which are kind of uh, supposed to 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 reinforce what I'm saying. But I I'm not actually going to show you what what they have actually measured. Right. Now, this picture we have seen, that's the experiment of, of, of John, measured by him. Uh, uh, and that was the first experiment which actually measured, which addressed uh, the occupation. So you can say, okay, fine, let's, if it's too difficult to, manipul to manipulate the levels, it's of course great if you could, could manipulate the levels. But it's difficult, so instead of that, Let's, let's start with some simple things. Let's, for instance, look what is the average phonon or mechanical resonate occupation. And if it happens to be below one, we just call it quantum limit. Well, I mean, that's, you, can, you, can, you can debate whether that's a good definition or not, but that's a reasonable definition. Right, and there have been at least three experiments uh, showing that, that you can bring the occupancy below one, and this is one, and, and then if you are below one, you are at the quantum state. Now in his design, actually the cavity is still seven gigahertz, but the mechanical resonator has a low frequency, so you have to cool it down a lot. And that's the first of, I, I said there are three, that the first of the three and the two, I don't have 
pictures of what they measured, but they measured the same thing. And I have already shown you the experiments themselves, which are those two experiments by Oscar Painter's group and, and by, uh, by Tabriski Painter's group. Now I will have two slides left. And that's again something which, 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 which my colleagues in Delft did, so that Simon Groblach's group. Simon will be here next week. And I assume he will be talking about that, though I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, you can also, I mean, there are a lot of other things you can measure uh, to convince yourself that your oscillator is quantum. Now, one thing is, is, the, thermo, is, is the occupation of the, of the states, but you can also, for instance, you can create entanglement, and there are entanglement measures. And then if you are measured something, uh, and, and you got the result which is compatible with the entanglement, you are sure your system is quantum. I don't know, belt test or something. Uh, now what they have done, they have actually measured a correlation function. The correlation function is defined as that, so you take that the correlation function of photons, of phonons, sorry, uh, uh, so B are phonons, so mechanical resonator, uh, you take two creation operators here, two annihilation operators here, at different times, uh, so they are delayed. Uh, that's Caris, you can measure it directly. Okay, no, just a second. You, you normalize it by that. And this is something which is always below zero and two. And there is a statement which is known from quantum optics, I'm not going to derive it that if you take that at time zero, so time delay is zero, so all those things are at the same time. Then if this correlation function time zero happens to be below one, then you are surely in the quantum state, in a non-classical state. And they have measured that. The, the, the problem is it's, of course, very difficult to measure. It can be easily measured in optics. There are interferometry experiments which can measure this correlation function for photons. And that's something which is, exists already for like 30 years or 40 years. People can measure it very reliably uh, with, with interferometry experiment, with, with two detectors, and they, they, they look at two detectors and then they see if there any correlation. Now the, the added value of this experiment, they actually find a way of translating uh, uh, photons, uh, phonons into photons. So they have some protocol which is too complicated to be explained here. This is, by the way, the cavity I explained in the morning. I, I've taken it from that slide. Uh, and they found some way of addressing uh, phonons by looking at photons. And they got a clear message. So they, I should also add, I don't think whether I have it. No, I don't have it on the slide. But they used resonators with very high frequency. So they had, was it six gigahertz? So they had the resonators which they don't, don't need to cool down. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a bit difficult to see from the figures, but for instance here, it shows this correlation function at zero as a function of the initial number of, 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 uh, of phonons. And uh, that actually, uh, it shows that, that there is a reasonable range when you are clearly below one, meaning you are clearly, the mechanical resonator is clearly in the quantum state. Um, okay, so there could be still some things here to do. There could be, as I said, it could be cool if somebody could generate entanglement, but probably the next major step would be to address quantum states, to really create a given quantum state in the resonator, in a mechanical resonator, and be able to read it out. And that's something which I'm not going to address today, but I will try to address it in my last lecture uh, on, on Thursday. And I think for the time being, I'll stop. <laughs>